Hey church family and everyone that is tuned into our e-campus. Hey, we are coming to you with some important information, some powerful information and promoting the power of prayer. So excited to be joined today by Reverend Linda Button, who is the prayer ministry leader. And she's gonna tell us about how October will turn in to the kickoff for the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Good afternoon. Hello, Crystal, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. Real quick, talk about the power of prayer and especially during this time of uncertainty, why is it so important for us as believers to hang on something that we know for sure changes? You know, one thing that our pastor said last month uh, when he gave us the six things to pray on continuously over the next year, he said this, there is nothing that God does that is not first initiated by prayer. Everything that happens is because somebody prayed. We felt like we need to come together as a church family to pray. We pray regularly, but we feel like it is the power of prayer. We need to exercise that gift that God has given us to pray. And he invites us to come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace in our time of need. And this is definitely a time of need. Why? And so you're talking about prayer, but let's add in the other dimension, which is fasting. Tell us how that will play into it. It's a 21 day partial fast. We're asking um, everyone to give up one meal each day and instead devote that time to prayer and fasting. For those individuals that are unable to fast, we're suggesting that you give up an activity, social media or TV, for that time and devote it in prayer to God. Or on our 26th week of praying, uh, it's our COVID-19 prayer call every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Uh, we invite the whole entire church to join with us. It's a telephone call. Uh, it comes out on the weekly email reminder to the church family. So you can dial into that line and join us in prayer every Wednesday. And during this fast in particular, we are hoping that the entire church will call in as we pray and bombard heaven together. We're praying that a vaccine will be found. We're praying that the sick will be healed. We're praying that the healthy will be protected. We are praying that the church will be edified. We're praying that the gospel will be magnified. God will be glorified. And also, very importantly, we will be praying that our pastor will be strengthened. Reverend, uh, Reverend Linda Button, is there anything else you want the members to know before we get out of here? It's such a privilege to pray. Yes. So I just invite you and welcome you, uh, the invitation that the Lord has already extended to join us and go into the throne of grace together. For more information about the 21 days of prayer and fasting, or if you have any prayer requests, be sure to email us at prayer at ssclive.org. You can also always visit us online at ssclive.org. Good afternoon. My name is Reverend Linda Button. I'm an assistant minister and prayer ministry leader here at St. Stephen Church. I'm also a member of the Sunday School class, Coffee Cafe in Christ. I greet you today in the matchless name of Jesus Christ and welcome you to the Pursuing Gold Bible Study. As we all know, we're in extraordinary times in a state of crises and some chaotic times. So the aim of our Bible study will be to encourage you and give you some tools and insight from the Word of God on pressing through in chaotic and uncertain times. I'm delighted that I will be able to share this with you over the, for the entire month of October. Today we're going to talk about now is not the time to faint. Now is not the time to faint. It goes without saying that 2020 has been an excruciatingly difficult year. Many are trying to survive major, life-threatening, life-altering, simultaneous pandemics with no end in sight. Listen to some of the many adjectives that describe life so far in 2020. Devastating, heartbreaking, turbulent, exhausting, 
overwhelming, stressful, depressing, exasperating, infuriating, frustrating, and gut-wrenchingly painful. These are certainly difficult times, and they can be summed up in two words, chaotic and uncertain. Yet, in spite of it all, now is not the time to faint. Luke 18, 1 tells us, And Jesus spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought to always pray and not faint. Jesus said we have a choice. We either faint or we pray. Now is not the time to quit. Now is not the time to give up. But now is the time to fight using the powerful weapons that are available to us in our spiritual arsenal. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. These are times we cannot depend on the human, but the divine, spiritual weapons provided by the Lord, which are in our, at our disposal. It's football season, and many of you are excited about it, that it's football season. But players, football players, don't show up on the field out of condition or come up with their own rules and expect to win. They must discipline themselves and execute strategies given to them by the coach to win games. So it is with Christians. We must listen to our coach and deploy spiritual strategies and weapons to win not only skirmishes, but the war raging against us that is designed to disable, disappoint, defeat, and to destroy us. 1 Peter 5 and 6 through 9 tells us, Be alert and sober of mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. But we have some promises. Oh, yes, we do. We have some certain promises from God. And Ephesians 6, 12 tells us, For we, not, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness, in the heavenly places. You see, we're battling against seen and unseen forces that are much greater than you and I can manage on our own. But thanks be to God, he has not left us helpless or hopeless. See, the righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. See, God has equipped us with weapons to use from our spiritual arsenal to restore and to revive us during these chaotic and uncertain times. There are numerous weapons that's in our spiritual arsenal. Tonight, today, I'm just going to focus on four of them, and there are many more. The first one I want to talk about briefly is humility. Humility, what is that? It's to bow low without a sense of pride. It's to humble yourselves before a sovereign God, before a holy and righteous God. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians seven fourteen tells us this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And then the word goes on to tell us in verse 15, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer 
made in this place. God is saying to you and I to humble ourselves in prayer, understanding that we have nothing on our own apart from God and that he promises us if that we would be humble, but then if we would also repent, we'll talk about that more in just a moment, but that he would hear our prayers and he would respond. And our second weapon in our arsenal is repentance. Repentance. Joel, Joel 2 verse 12 through 13 says this, even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Joel reminds us that we have to repent, turn away from those things that take, away, take us away from the presence of God and take us away from being obedient to the word of God. Return and come back to God. And the word promises us that our God abounds in love and that he's most gracious and most compassionate, always willing to aid us in our time of need. Isn't that good news? I don't know about you, but that gets me excited that my God is on my side. And then the third weapon in our arsenal is prayer. And of course, we know something about prayer. Prayer is our primary method to communicate with God. See, during chaotic and uncertain times, one thing you don't want to do is to cut off your only means and source of communication with God. It's, it's like being a soldier on the battlefield. When you don't communicate with God, it's like all communication, communication is lost. You must not ever lose control of your communication with your command center. God sits high. We sit low. He sees everything we cannot see, seen and unseen. He sees what's coming and sees what's going before we can even imagine it or see it. So we don't want to cut off our communication and prayer is our communication. We're good soldiers because prayer is the battle and we are commanded to pray without ceasing. Yes, God has given us so many gracious promises. And you know what's wonderful? Prayer and the word of God work together. See, your instruction manual is the word of God. Every good soldier needs to have direction and instruction. And as a soldier fit for battle, you must seek instruction, be alert and never give up. Ephesians 6, 18 tells us this. Do this, do all this in prayer, asking for God's help. Pray on every occasion as the spirit leads. For this reason, keep alert and never give up. Pray always for all God's people. What fasting, let's talk about fasting. It's our fourth weapon that we're going to talk about today. And we're going to tarry here for the remainder of our time together. So let's talk about fasting because the St. Stephen Church, we're ready to engage in a time of prayer and fasting. So what, well, let's first talk about what fasting is not. Fasting is not about losing weight as with intermittent fasting that is now a popular fad. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, I'm not sure. Maybe I need to try it. What fasting is not? Fasting is not manipulation are some method to use to get what you want from God. But it comes from a heart of motivation to find out what God wants from you. See, fasting is not for show or demonstration of spiritual prowess. Fasting is actually confession of spiritual dependence on the power of God that works within each of us. 
Jesus reminds us of this in John 15, 5. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I tell you what, I, I, I stand on that word regularly, day in and day out, because I'm at a period in my life that I know I have nothing but God. Apart from him, I can do nothing. Apart from him, I can't wake myself up in the morning. I can't set myself on my way. I need God's direction. I need to hear his voice. I need to lean in on him. I need to depend on him to tell me how to make wise choices and decisions for my life. And when I'm going the wrong direction, apart from him, I can do nothing. I never want to sever that relationship or that tie with an almighty sovereign God. So what is fasting? Fasting is one of our great spiritual weapons. As I said earlier, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, these weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. What is fasting? Fasting is a time of denial, abstaining from food for a spiritual purpose. Think about this for a moment. moment. You may not realize it, but you fast every day. You eat your last meal, then go to bed at night. The next morning when you wake and you get up and you eat breakfast, you're literally breaking the fast. That's why it's called breakfast. Fasting is also a time of repentance, consecrated prayer, and spiritual focus. Fasting causes you to lean in in utter dependence, and particularly when you are de desperately seeking divine intervention. See, fasting requires you to humble yourself before God, which I've already talked about, Focus so focusing solely on God and God alone, and drawing nearer to Him in prayer, and free from all other distractions. Have you noticed that when you try to pray, and when you try to lean into God in prayer, have you noticed how the enemy will come in and immediately he'll make you think about all these things that have nothing to do with your conversation with God? You'll think about the dinner you have to prepare later. You'll think about a hair appointment. You'll think about your children and all these other things rather than communing with God. When you sacrifice and fast, you're literally denying yourself. You're telling to God in a spirit of weakness there you might gain strength. And so fasting is a powerful place that we need to understand is a weapon that we need to utilize often and frequently. It's different types of fasting. And I mentioned this earlier. I'm going to only focus on congregational fasting. The St. Stephen Church is a magnificent church. We get a strong word of God. That's why I'm so blessed and I know that you are too. We have a powerful pastor, powerful Christian education, Sunday school teacher that teaches us on a regular basis. But on this fast, we're gonna fast as a congregation starting October 4th on Sunday and ending on October 25th. In fact, Sunday was yesterday, so we're starting Oct it started October 4th, we've already started, and we're going to end it October 25th. And it's a 21-day Daniel fast. It's a partial fast. What do you have to do? You only have to sacrifice one meal each day. One meal each day. You decide, you choose which meal that is. And for those that have reasons you cannot miss a meal or fast, then fast something else that's near and dear to you. Put down Facebook for an hour. Cut off the TV for an hour. Turn off Twitter for an hour. Instagram for a moment. And spend that time, you and God alone, 
communing and talking and you sharing your needs and then listening for what God has to say to you because it's a two-way conversation. It's never a mon monologue. It's definitely a dialogue. And so we come humbly before Father who loves us and trusts us and that is waiting for us to tell him that we love him and then to tell him what we need from him. It's a partial fast. I've already told you that. So do that and be intense about it. So fasting. So the next question is, what is expected? Fasting, what is expected? Matthew 6, 16 through 18 reminds us this. And when you fast, do not pray. Do, and when you fast, do not put on a sad face as the hypocrites do. They neglect their appearance so that everyone will see that they are fasting. I assure you, they have already been paid in full. When you go without food, wash your face and comb your hair so that others cannot know that you are fasting. Only your father who is unseen will know and your father who sees what you do in private will reward you. Jesus is talking here and what he's teaching his disciples is fasting is a commitment between an individual and God. And in a congregation of fast, of course, we all know that we're fasting, but each and every individual will come to God in their own way. And we don't have to brag and tell others that we're fasting, but what we can tell others is, I have a God that is so good. He's so good to me and I'm so thankful that he allows me to come and talk to him and spend some time with him so I can learn more about him and ultimately learn more about who I am. And so Jesus reminds us and, and notice this, that in that particular verse, Jesus did not say if we fast, but when. And when you fast is what he said. For Jesus, it was not a matter or if you would fast, but when you would fast. See, there are times when Jesus expects us to pray and fast. See, in Matthew 6, Jesus had just finished going through a teaching on the Lord's Prayer with his disciples. Now he's teaching them part two, how to integrate fasting with your prayer, which is what we're trying to do. See, one can pray without fasting, but one cannot fast biblically without prayer. They go together. See, prayer and fasting go hand in hand. It works together like a hand fits into a glove. See, the glove's primary purpose is to cover and protect the hand from elements, from coronavirus, if you will, from hard work, and even it's fashionable. The hand does not need the glove, but the glove needs the hand to fulfill its purpose. So it is with prayer and fasting. Prayer doesn't always require you to fast, but there are times when you're facing serious threats and ex you need to take extraordinary measures to deal with an extraordinary crisis. And most often, during chaos and times of uncertainty, our faith wanes and it grows weary. We struggle. I know that I have and I believe that many of you have as well. This has not been easy times. Our lives have been turned upside down. Things are not norm normal. Everything is abnormal. But the only thing that is normal is that we know that God does not change, that God has not lost control, that God is still sovereign, that God is sitting, still holding the world in his hands. Hallelujah. Bless God for that. That's comforting to know. But as our faith grows weary and we're about ready to faint and give up, it, this could be a clear indicator that it's time to fast and pray. In other words, new devils, new levels. You have to step up where you currently are or you might stay where you are. 
But if you want to press through during uncertain times, hallelujah, you've got to step up and integrate prayer with fasting. And see, Matthew 7, 19 through 21 tells us this. Then prayer doesn't, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? They're talking about demons, a demonic force. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can speak to this mountain and tell it to move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing, nothing will be impossible for you. However, Jesus said, this kind, this demonic kind, does not go out except by prayer and fasting. In other words, he's still saying once again, and where he's reaffirming that sometimes you can pray, but you have to integrate fasting to get in that deeper spiritual mode and level with God. And see, prayer and fasting together is a powerful combination. It takes the focus off our problems and puts it squarely in God's hands. And that act alone strengthens our faith. It helps you to recognize that all things truly are possible to them that believe. And Matthew 16, 18 also reminds us that prayer and fasting done God's way will be rewarded by the Father. So I just want to ask you a question or two here and give you a moment to think about all we've talked about so far. What keeps you from fasting? When you fasted in the past or attempted to fast, what was the result? Who gauged the result or the success? Was it effective? And what was the result? It's just something for you to think about because if you're going to fast and we are fasting, you have to take steps to effective fasting and prayer. Let me quickly, quickly give you four things to do. You have to commit and plan which meal you will sacrifice each day. That's Proverbs 16, 3. You have to have a plan. You have to confess and repent of your sins and your shortcomings. 1 John 1 and 9 reminds us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to cleanse us from our sins. Hallelujah. And then we have to meditate on the word of God. And I suggest that we listen and view our pastor's powerful points to ponder that he does daily. Because as you're praying and fasting, it, it's about, a, I already told you, it's about a spiritual focus. So what you want to meditate on the word and the scripture that he gave us for that day. And then finally, pray for others as you're praying. Prayer and, and fasting and prayer is not about coming to God with our list. It's about coming to God to find out his will for our lives. And so to do that, you have to pray for others. Get the focus off yourself. I don't know about you, but I have found when I intercede and when I press in for others, somehow, some way, don't ask me how he does it. He just does. He will do something that I never even smoke, spoke out of my mouth, but somehow, some way, God already knew. And he took care of that just because in faith, I put others before myself. And so pray for others and then daily ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Yes, it's true. We were filled with the Holy Spirit when we were saved. But it's also true that we need to come back continuously for daily refilling or refueling of the Holy Spirit. I never get off my knees or spiritual knees without asking God, 
to fill me, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Remove me out of me. Put you in me. And so I just ask you to do that. Ask him to fill you. So let's talk about for a few more minutes and then we'll try to wrap up. I'm going to look at where I'm at. Let's talk about the benefits of prayer and fasting. There are benefits. The Bible teaches us that you can greatly benefit from prayer and fasting. There were many in the Bible that were blessed by God because they were obedient to these spiritual disciplines. And in turn, they're great witnesses for you and I. Let's look at a few. Fasting can break spiritual, fasting and prayer can break spiritual strongholds. See, fasting sets free those that are bound and entangled by strongholds. Fasting done God's way will be rewarded by God. He promises his presence, his protection and restoration and that he will hear you when you call upon him in prayer. Listen to what he says in Isaiah 58, 6 through 7 or 6 through 9. The kind of fasting I want is this. Remove the chains of oppression and the yoke of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Share your food with the hungry and open your homes to the homeless poor. Give clothes to those who have nothing to wear and do not refuse to help your own relatives. Then in verse eight, my favor will shine on you like the morning sun and your wounds will be quickly healed. Did you hear what God just said? If you do fasting his way and you think about others and their needs and you simply do the right thing that God asks us to do, his favor will shine on you like the morning sun. You, you, you all know that vitamin D, we, we go in the sun to get vitamin D. And without the sun, your vitamin D could actually get low. And so Isaiah is telling us a method to be healed. God's sunlight, sunlight will shine on you. Yeah, that's right, sunlight. His sunlight will shine on us and your wounds will be quickly healed. And then he goes on to say, I will always be with you to save you. My presence will protect you on every side. We have a rear guard and a fore guard that's protecting us. And then he makes this promise. When you pray, I will answer you. When you call to me, I will respond. That's good news. See, I'm about ready to shout myself right there because I know that my pri prayers will pay off. I may not get what I want when I want when I need it, but I've also learned as our church school lesson taught us a few weeks ago that God has three possible answers. Yes, no, and wait. And if you're in the will of God, we just have to learn to be patient and learn how to wait on him. That's why I talked about we've got to press in. And so then our better benefit is fasting and prayer deepens and draws us nearer to God. You remember Anna, don't you, in Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 37? Anna was the daughter of Penuel, the tribe of Asher. Anna was elderly. She was 84. And the Bible said she was a widow. She never left the temple, but she worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. In other words, what she was doing was shoring up and building up and edifying her relationship with God. It was important to her to draw near to God. Another benefit, prayer and fasting is necessary in hopeless situations. Nehemiah, you remember him? He was held captive in Babylon. He heard about Jerusalem being in disarray. His heart was grieved. The Bible said he wept and he mourned and he fasted and he prayed to the God of heaven, heaven and Nehemiah was serving as the king's cupbearer, but he was in a hopeless situation, but he desperately wanted to go back home 
to help rebuild the walls around Jerusalem to protect the people of God. Guess what God did? God answered his prayer. The Bible said, so it pleased the king to send me. And so another benefit from prayer and fasting is for protection and direction. Ezra prayed to God. He sought God's face and fasted for protection and direction. Before the trip back to Jerusalem, Ezra had the exiles that were with him to fast and pray for safety while traveling on the dangerous band, bandit infested roadways. God led them, listen, through hostile territory and no one attacked them because they had divine protection from on high. So he fasted and prayed and he said, and our God answered our prayer. And then another benefit of prayer and fasting, it gives you courage to take risk. You remember Esther, the Jewish nation was facing a threat of annihilation when Queen Esther requested Mordecai to gather all the Jews in Susa and fast. And Esther, despite the fact that she wasn't supposed to go in to the king without being summoned, she risked her life, dared to enter into the room and not only enter, but to speak to him. God gave her courage and you know the outcome. The entire nation was spared, spared in, a bitter, in a bitter twist of irony. Haman, the enemy that wanted to destroy the people of God, he himself was destroyed in a sudden reversal of royal edicts only by God. And I just got to stop right here and say, won't God do it? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've seen him do it. What the enemy meant for evil, God meant it for our good. Another benefit of prayer and fasting, it empowers you to fight. When Satan gains a foothold in our lives, we tend to try everything but fasting. When Satan did his best to tempt Christ after 40 days and nights in the wilderness, the Bible said Jesus went out and prayed and fasted and then triumphed over Satan. Jesus, the Bible said, was full of the Holy Spirit. That's why I say you have to ask the Lord to fill you with his spirit. And Jesus returned, the Bible said in Luke 4, 4, in the power of the spirit. He started out full of the spirit. And after he prayed and fasted, he became empowered by the spirit. Y'all didn't hear me. After he prayed and fasted, he became empowered by the Spirit. Amen? And so can you and I. Another benefit of prayer and fasting, it equips us for spiritual battle. King Jehoshaphat, he had heard multiple hostile armies were surrounding the small nation of Judah. They lacked adequate resources to meet this dangerous threat. What did he do? He first inquired with the Lord. That's prayer. And then he gathered, gathered the people together and proclaimed a fast. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20 verses 3 and 4, the Bible reminds us, after they fasted and prayed, the Lord told them, do not be afraid are discouraged because of this vast army, of this great enemy that has you boxed in, this enemy of COVID that has you surrounded. It's an invisible enemy that we can't see coming or going. But the Lord reminded them, as he reminds you and I today, for this battle is not yours, but God's. Our part in the battle is to do what we're instructed to do and leave the rest to God. But Jehoshaphat followed God's instruction. And when they went out to meet the enemy nation, as God instructed, they didn't take a sword. They didn't take a shield. The only weapon they took in battle was praise. Sometimes when you're pressed in, 
sometimes when you're so down and out and you don't see a way through, the only way you can get through this battle is to press your way through and praise your way through and use your spiritual weapon of praise to fight them some battles. See, you always have to be on guard and be alert and be ready to offer up a sacrifice of praise. Hallelujah. The psalmist declared this in Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall, shall hear of and thereof and be glad. This is my verse. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us, you and I, exalt his name together. And I like this verse. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. See, I learned a long time ago that praise is what I do. When I want to be close to you, this is what I tell God. I have been in some situations where I was squares in, pressed on every hand, did not see a way out, our way anyway. But when I looked up, and when I took my eyes off the situation, when I put them on God, and when I remembered what God had already done, when I looked back at all the many times that he's brought me through, I just learned to lift up my hands, to lift up my eyes to glory. And I learned how to bless his name. I learned how to understand that praise is what I do. When I want to be close to you, I lift my hands in praise. Praise is who I am. I will praise him while I can. I will bless him at all times. And I made this vow that I vowed to praise you, Lord, as the songwriter did. Through the good and the bad, I'll praise you, whether happy or sad. I'll praise you in all that I go through because praise is what I do. Let me tell you this, because I owe it all to you, Lord. Come on now. I know it's been hard. I know you're hurting. I know that you're weary, worn, and tired. But in prayer, you'll find a resting place. And the Lord Jesus will make you glad. Now is not the time to faint. Prayer is the place of power. Prayer provides solutions to our problems. Prayer is an answer to unbearable circumstances. Prayer steers the heart of God. Prayer is the church's response to a hurting world. In this, you can be confident. We have in approaching God everything that we ask according to his will. He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, he will answer whatever we ask of him. We know that God makes that promise and it's for you and I. And I'm trying to turn off this. <laughs> and so let us close with a word of prayer. And I pray that you are blessed by the word of God and that you will continue and you will join in in prayer and fasting. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, we come, to your, come into your presence and kneel down at your throne of grace. Father, we thank you for the privilege always of prayer. We thank you, God, that you reminded us in this study tonight, God, that now is not the time to faint, but now is the time to pick up and utilize the spiritual weapons that you've given us at our disposal and that we can win this battle because you've already won the war. Father, we thank you today that victory has already been won. We thank you for Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made for us. We thank you for his blood, O oh God. Now we are they, O oh God, 
who are coming out of great tribulation, covered by the blood of the Lamb. We declare in the name of Jesus, we stand on his word and his promise that no weapon that is formed against us shall be able to prosper. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for all the weapons you've given us and we bless you for this time. I ask this prayer and I glorify your name in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Bless God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.